is a wonderful change. Change. turned around? Has your life been made over? Have your life been made differently? If it has, it's because God has. I say God has. He's brought about a wonderful, a wonderful change. And he's brought it about in our lives. And only God can bring about this kind of change. Hallelujah to the Lamb. We thank God for who he is and what he's already done. He has brought change over many of us, even in this room. We serve the awesome and the amazing God. And no one can change us like he has. And if you haven't been changed, just try Jesus. God will bring about a wonderful, a wonderful change. We call your attention to the book of Proverbs, chapter number 16, verses 1 through 3. The book is Proverbs, the chapter is 16, the verses are 1, 2, and 3. In the Old Testament, the book is Proverbs. The chapter is 16. We'll be looking at verses 1, 2, and 3. If you found it, you will discover these words. The preparation of the heart belongs to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes. But the Lord weighs the spirits. Commit your works to the Lord. And your thoughts will be established. I don't want to talk about commit to the Lord. Commit to the Lord. This time of year, we all are making New Year's resolutions. By now, our New, Re New Year's resolutions are at least one or two weeks old, depending if you made it in December or January. And since it's maybe two weeks old, you may have even forgotten by now what your resolutions were. I told you last week, you ought to write it down, make it plain, and put your vision before the Lord. And all of us in this room ought to have some type of change that we are looking forward to making. It's a New Year's resolution. It's a brand new year in which life has given us and God has granted us one more chance to get it right. God has walked through us through the hype of the COVID-19 virus. He has kept us in the midst of our family members, our friends, and the midst of our co-workers expiring. I want to serve you notice it's not because you have a good healthy diet that you're here. 
It's not because of your exercise regimen that you're still living. It's not even because of your B12, nor is it because of your D3 that got you here. You can take a plethora of vitamins, and you ought to. You can exercise daily, and you ought to. You can eat well and make sure you put away the beef, the pork, and all the other trimmings. But at the end of the day, it's going to take God to keep you alive. You see, there are some who have gone on before us and some who are hurting even right now. There are many who are incubated, who can't breathe on their own. But God has allowed you to walk into the house of prayer one more time. And for that, I thank him. It's not because you're so holy. And we ought to be holy. We ought to be separated. We ought to be sanctified. But it's not because you've been so holy. Because when you put your holiness on the scale with your unholiness, I tell you the truth, your unholiness tips the scale. It doesn't matter if you're the preacher, the deacon, the choir member. doesn't matter if you're a member of the invitation to walk into the door through the greeters. It does not matter if you are a part of the First Impressions ministry or you are a part of the sitting, sour, and soaking ministry. You are not here because you just chose to be here. You're not here. You're not here because God has given you another chance, and, and then you were smart enough to keep that chance alive. That's not why you're here. You are here. You are born. You are living. You are breathing. You have blood running to every extremity of your body because of God's awesome power and how God has blessed us one more again. And for that, that's enough to run and tell somebody. That's enough to run and talk about the goodness of God and how good Jesus has been to you. The wise writer in Proverbs 16 talks about the fact that we make plans. He says, the preparation of the heart belongs to man. I told you on last week that you ought to choose somebody to walk with you who has a plan for their lives. I said to the women on yesterday yester week that you need to make sure that if you are engaging with somebody, you are desiring to be with somebody, you need to make sure the brother at least has a one-year plan, a six-month plan, and surely he ought to have a plan for the day. I said to the men on last week, and I say again, if you're going to attach yourself to somebody and you're going to walk with them, make sure that they are walking with the Lord. Because it takes a good man to lead a good spiritual woman. It takes a spiritual man to lead a spiritual woman. It takes a spiritual woman to follow a spiritual man. You know, for years, for years and years, for years and years, women have thought that to submit was something derogatory. Women have believed that that word submit means that you have to become a doormat. But I just want to serve you notice today, sister, when you are willing to submit to a man that's following God, then you're saying, God, let me duck down and let you hit him with the, the re responsibility. Yeah, God holds, God holds men responsible for how they lead children, for how they lead their family, how they lead women. God is holding us responsible to be good godly men. Therefore, we have to have a plan. The songwriter says, God has brought about a wonderful change in our lives. Now that we have crossed over from 2023 into 2024, God should have made some changes in your life. I'm trying to tell you this morning that what bothered you in 2023 ought not bother you in 2024. I stopped by on my way to the rapture to let you know whatever you were so sensitive about in 2023, it's time to grow up in 2024. Because the devil is on the rampage. 
The devil is looking to separate men, women, boys, and girls. The devil is looking to separate us from the divine one, God himself. Let me just let you know, you're not so special that the devil is after you. You, you're, not, you're not so holy until the devil is trying to tear you down. The Apostle Paul says that there's a war going on. First of all, he says in Ephesians, there's a war going on all around us. And this war that's going on is in the heavenly places above where we can see. This war that's going on, that in this war, God is the one who's the target and not you. The devil chooses us as little pawns to, to put us in places because we acknowledge God. Let me tell you, you're not so holy that the devil's trying to tear you down. He's trying to make God look bad. He's trying to make sure that he served God notice that if he can get to you, then God doesn't have you in a hedge around you. But we ought to be like Job. We ought to be righteous. We ought to be holy. We ought to be sanctified to the point where God can brag on us. Is God bragging on you? Is God saying any good things about you? Is God saying that you are walking with him? You're listening to his word. You're reading his word. You're saturating your heart with his word. And your wor his words become your words. The text declares in verse number one that men make preparation. Men make plan. This word men mean human beings. Men ought to make plans. You ought not wake up willy-nilly every morning. You ought not wake up without a plan on your calendar or a plan on your heart. Everybody, everybody has a little, little device now. When you get to, they get you a device. Before you can spell A, B, and C, they get you a device. Everybody, got, everybody has a device now. Everybody, everybody, a uh, uh, brother Paul, sooner or later, that little baby going to have a device. And you are not going to be able to tell that baby that that baby can't have a device. Because we are not teaching our children through books anymore. We are teaching our children through the device. And every now and then, the child is going to get hooked on the device. And we have the audacity, the nerve, to try to shun the children and turn them away from the device. But the children see that we have devices. And we are hooked on the device. The question was, the other day, the question was, what if we treated our Bibles the way we treat our phones? This morning, this morning, this morning, I just want to testify. I just want to let you know this morning, I drove out of the neighborhood, and before I could hit the exit, I said, whoops, I forgot my phone. <laughs> we, we, already, we already should have been here at 745. I said, oops, it's 726, and I forgot my phone. There was no argument in the car. There were no suggestions that I was, should continue without my phone. I mean, I hit a wheelie right then and there, right in the middle of the road. Skirt, and went back and, and searched through the place until I found my phone. What if we would treat our Bibles? We wouldn't leave home without it. What if we would treat our Bibles where we just got to have it with us? What if every time we got into an argument, we wouldn't call up Mr. Google or Miss Google, we would call up our, our Bibles instead of our phones. What if, what if every meeting we went to, we would take out our Bible and write a note in there that I got to be here at 7 a.m. in the morning. In other words, I got to study the word of God at 6 a.m. so I can get out the door at 7 a.m. What if, what if we would take our phones and, and look through our calendars and say, well, I spent time with God about two hours this morning, and I need to put on my calendar, spend time with him about an hour during the lunch period, and then I need to spend about two more hours with him at the end of the day. The text declares that we ought to make preparation. You ought not let things sneak up on you without making preparation. How many of you in this room know that if Jesus wait, if Jesus doesn't come right away, how many of you know that you're going to die? Anybody? Nobody in this room knows it. Let me just serve notice that sooner or later, you're going to die. 
It doesn't matter how buff you are. It doesn't matter whether you got a six-pack or an eight-pack. And if you're carrying a keg like I am, it does not matter what you look like. It doesn't matter how much Mary Kay you put on. I'm telling you, sooner or later, you're going to leave here. And you're going to leave all your stuff. Since you know you're going to leave, you might as well put a wheel together so folk won't fight each other. You might as well put a wheel together so, so people won't act like they don't know each other. You might as well put a wheel together so it can halfway settle the argument. Let me just serve notice on you. When you get out of here, it's not going to serve as a shutdown to the whole argument. But it will give some direction. My next point to you is you ought to make preparation. Since you know you're going to get out of here, you need to make preparation to get out of here. You need to tell your folk whether you want to be cremated or whether you want them to get that expensive casket or whether you want them to throw some money in the ground. Since you know you got to leave here, go ahead and prepare to leave here. I mean, folk, folk talk about it when people leave. They, they're like, oh, they sure did put her up good. Boy, they sure did put her away good. That cream casket that she wanted, they gave it to her. The undertaker upcharged her, but it's all right. I want this for my family member. I mean, it's $20,000 that you're pouring in the ground that's not going to be there forever. I mean, you're just pouring it, and you better make preparation because folk going to sell chicken dinners if you don't make preparation. Folk going to have barbecues if you don't make preparation. Matter of fact, if you don't make preparation, they going to leave you out just as long as they left Jane Brown out. And the longer they leave you out, they going to forget you even exist. Now, they do folk who are expensive like that. They, they spent time waiting because they have a lot of money to settle. And folk don't want to spend money on you when you're gone. Now, you can spend all your money on your children now. You can give them everything they want. But when it's time for you to get out of here, if you have not laid up and made preparation, look, they're going to say there's a pine box, put them in there. And the thing that they're doing now is uh, they're renting caskets. They, they roll you in here. They, makes a big, they make a big presentation. They rent it out for the day. And then the preacher says, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And then they take you out. And then they cremate you. Look at how you're looking at me. Look, look, at, look at how you're looking. Look at how you're looking at me. And people spend money on stuff to impress people that don't even like them. They look, they spend money on stuff to impress people that's going to talk bad about you. So you might as well come to a conclusion now how you want to leave here because you're going to leave here and don't throw away a whole lot of money. Matter of fact, in other cultures, in other cultures, they make sure the church is taken care of before they leave. What you talking about, Reverend? Uh, what I'm saying to you is, in their will, they make sure that as they are living, they give the Lord 10% of their gross income before they leave. After they leave, they make sure in their will that they have new beginning church in their will, and they leave 10 plus percent to the new beginning church. What you talking about, Reverend? What I'm saying to you is that you need to understand that God holds us accountable as we get out of here as well as he holds us accountable while we're still here. A wise writer says, make preparation. Be wise. We don't have a baby and let that baby just grow up any kind of way. Matter of fact, families select the neighborhoods that they're going to live in because they know they have children, and they want to choose a neighborhood where there are good schools, 
They are fine daycares. They want to choose a neighborhood that they can be blessed in the neighborhood. They walk around the neighborhood. They spend the Saturday nights and, and Friday morning in the neighborhood to see how folk are getting along in the neighborhood, making sure no stray bullets are being shot in the, in the neighborhood. They want to make sure they make proper preparation so their children can grow up safely, so their children can be educated. If you want to know what a good solid neighborhood looks like, every neighborhood that is a solid neighborhood has a church there. It has a school there. It has a recreation facility there. It has hospitals there. It has everything you need for a family to survive in the neighborhood. You know why? You know you know why the superintendent was sent to Houston, Texas. So he can tear up our neighborhoods. When you close a school, when you close a hospital, and when the mayor tells the churches that we will not have any more churches built in this neighborhood, they are tearing down the neighborhood. He was sent here for this very purpose, and let me tell you, he's doing his job. He's on his job. He, he's getting rid of people that don't have, they don't have, he doesn't have a cause to get rid of. And our children are suffering from a lack of education. That's why I say to young folk, get your education now because when you get old and gray and bald like me, you ain't going to be able to do it. And when you get your education now, they can't take it from you. It doesn't matter if you're black, if you're brown, if you're yellow, if you're Anglo or Caucasian. Let me tell you, when you get your education, you got something you can live with. Get it now. You got a better chance now than I had. You got a better chance. You got better equipment. You have a better mind than I've ever had. Young folk can think on the run. They can multitask. Young, young people can tell me what I need to do before I even get there. We have to make preparation. We still marching in the street even from 1960. We're still protesting the same things from 1960. We're still buying and begging and bothering for stuff that should have been taken care of in 1960. It's because we are not aware of what's going around us. We got to get aware. We got to get aware. We have to be spiritually aware and we have to be socially aware of what's going on. Another way they, they tear up our neighborhoods is that they keep moving board, voting posts and shutting down voting posts from here to there. Let me tell you, people died for your right to vote. And don't come talking this crazy stuff about, I don't like this person, so I'm not going to vote. So if you don't vote, then you've just put the other person in office. We have to utilize and be prepared for everything that God shares with us and brings before us. That's why we have a great music program. That's why we have a robotics program. That's, that's why we are feeding technology into young people now because when you go to Walmart, they got one person directing you to cashiers that, that speak to you in a robotic form. There's no blood flowing through that cashier. And if the light is on, I mean, I went to Walmart a couple of days ago, and, and the lady said, all of our machines will shut down at 11 o'clock. And guess what? I rushed in the back and came back, and when I got back, there was not a machine that had a green light on it. The woman said to me, you missed it. You can come back tomorrow. They had no sympathy. They had machines that automatically shut down, and the machine goes into the counting mode. And they had two or three people for 34 hours. And all of that technology they put in that place to scan stuff with, they got clothes, clothes, laying clothes, and they have long lines. It's because somebody has to learn technology so we can stay on top of the game. He says, be prepared. He says, preparation, preparation is in the heart of the man and belongs to the man. Young people, get involved in seminars that's going to teach you some things. My uncle, my uncle says it like this. He said, man, I've been one of the biggest fools. 
He said when he was working at a school, the man came by to talk about how he can save money through annuities, and he went outside and smoked. He said, oh, I don't want to hear that kind of stuff. He said, I ain't got time for that. Now he's in his 70s. He said, I was the biggest fool because I just didn't listen. Let me tell you, listen. Just, just listen. Just listen. You have time to, to filter through the, the stuff later, but at least get knowledge. Getting knowledge will make a difference. It says, prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. A change is coming. The old folk used to say back home, you better prepare for a rainy day. A rainy day is coming. And they're not talking about hurricanes. They're, they're not talking about the rain and the flood. They're saying a rainy day is coming. And guess what? That rainy day is here. Slavery as we once knew it no longer exists, but slavery is alive and well today. When you got, got people talking about they got privileges, and slavery is alive and well today. They may not put chains on your hands. They may not put chains on your legs, but they are putting chains on our minds. And we're fighting each other over nothing. Usually when a fight is over, people don't even know why they were fighting. I just don't like how he looked at me. I just don't know why they treat me like they do. And you can't throw the race card at everything. Get something in your head. Get something in your heart so it can come out in your life. Young people don't have time to skip school. I know you may not use it, but most of it you will. And it just matters to be obedient to leadership. Because one day you're going to leave. And when you lead, you're going to want people to follow. It's a terrible thing when a man tells a woman, look, you need to submit to me. Well, if you're going to submit to him, he ought to be submitting to God. Because every man that submits to God, I hope that Christian women have no problem with submitting to him. But why would I submit to you if I don't see you submitting to anybody? Every job you get on, you fall out with the boss. Every time they tell you they're changing your, your, your area, your, your shift, you're like, well, I ain't going to do that. And it has cost us great income. We have to learn. The Ecclesiastic text says there's a time to talk and there's a time to stop talking. There's a time to protest, and there's a time to stop protesting. I really enjoy watching young people in their, their nonviolent protests. You see, Brother Carter, young people these days are different from us. We were diplomatic in our protest. Young folk these days just look at you, walk up to you, and let you know what time it is. I say to you, young people, make sure you think it through before you say it. Make sure you think it through before you do it. Because in the process, right now, you are making preparation for your future. No one in this room, no one in this room ought to ret retire broke, busted, and disgusted. I said no one, no, no one in this room. You, God has given you another chance. God has left you on planet Earth to make a difference. But you have to make preparation now for your future. You have to make preparation. He says, preparation is in the heart of the man, and it belongs to him. It's your place to make preparation. It's your place to make plans. This word preparation means to make plans, which means to position things in order. When you're making preparation, you're making plans, you got to position things in a particular order. Sit down and write it down. Sit down and lay it out. Position it. This word positioning and, and placing things in a particular order is like arranging soldiers in a line. If you ever watch the military, there's not one soldier out of step. There's not one soldier out of line. There's not one soldier doing his or her own thing. That's why at church we say stand, everybody ought to stand. 
pastor tells the story. One particular pastor tells the story how, how everybody was standing and praising the Lord and, and the instruction has been given to stand and praise the Lord. I'm not talking about cults. I'm talking about worship. Everybody's standing and praising the Lord, and it was that one sister over there just sitting in there, and, and she was chanting to herself. After church, the pastor asked, why wasn't you up and, and praising the Lord when everybody else was up? He, she says, I was just in the spirit. He said, yeah, you were in some spirits, but you weren't in the Holy Spirit. Because when you walk in the Holy Spirit, you are able to get in line and be placed in line like a soldier preparing for battle. And because there's a war going on, we need to be prepared for battle. We got to get it in our head, get it in our heart so we can prepare for battle. The other thing that the Apostle Paul says is found in Romans chapter 7. And he says, not only is there a war going on in heavenly places, he says there's a war going on inside of us. He says, once you're saved, once you're born again, God appreciates that and you appreciate God. You are saved, you are born again. But let me just tell you, since you got saved, there's a war going on within you. There's a wrestle within you. The literary term says it like this. In every literary writing, there are three different wars. There are three different conflicts. Man against man. Man against himself, and man against nature. And let me tell you, when, when we're riding and we're going down, when we're riding the bikes and we're going down Cullen, it's a smooth ride, smooth sailing going down Cullen. But on our way, I'm not superstitious, but on our way back, right there at that cemetery, it's like a bear jumps on our backs. I mean, the wind is, the wind is blowing. And it, Every single Saturday is right there. Every single Thursday is right there at that cemetery. It's like the wind comes out of the cemetery and just takes over and begin to push you back. We have to understand that's man fighting against nature. Then there's man against man. Man against man is when somebody always trying to hold you back. And the problem with, with Facebook posts and social media posts, everybody know when somebody holding you back. Because you're going to tell the world, if you do something to me, then God going to get you. But Bible says when you call on God, call on him in your secret closet. And after you have shut the door, call him in secret. And the God who hears in secret will reward you openly. You don't have to tell them that God's going to get them. You don't have to tell them that God is going to set it straight. God openly sets it straight. The psalmist says in Psalm number one that, that he prepared the table before you in the presence of your enemies. God will set up a banquet just so your enemies can come and watch you be blessed. You got to know how to be blessed. You don't need to post it on everything. Matter of fact, Matthew says it like this in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 18. Matthew says it like this. When somebody do you wrong, you go to them one on one. And then he says, if you can't sell it then, you go to them two or three others. Then it says, if you can't sell it then, you take them before the church. And then if they don't cure it up in the church, then let them go like a heathen. Now look, Matthew is not telling you to do all this in one day. This is a process of time. It's, it's underdoing much prayer. It's, it's underdoing much talking. It's, it's communicating together. And if God can communicate with us and rash things out with us, we ought to be able to rash things out with each other. And God says, come now. Let us reason together. Come now and let us talk about this thing. We have to make preparation. And as we make preparation, the next part of that verse says, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. If you prepare through your word, if you study your word, if you spend time in your word, then what comes out of your mouth will be what's in your heart, and what's in your heart will line up with God. How many cussers we got in the room? Don't raise your hand. I saw 10, 20 hands going up already. I mean, in my sanctified imagination. When you cuss like a seaport sailor, that means you're limited on your vocabulary. 
When, when you got to use short words and then extend them to long words, that tells me you got to increase your vocabulary. Because you can tell somebody else oh, real sweet. And you never have to, have to use a mumbling word. I was messing with Sister Henry this morning, and she told me off like sweet in the church house. And then when I walked away, she called me back to tell me off some more. And, and to her defense, she never said a mumbling cuss word. But she wanted me to be set straight, and she made sure Sister Whitlock heard her set me straight. Now, that doesn't mean Sister Henry is not a cusser. That just means she respect the church and respect the pastor enough to, to not to lay it all out there. Brother Miles, that, that, that says nothing about her character. That just says something about the moment, about that moment. But the answer comes from, from God. God gives us the answer. This word, Lord, is the self-existing God, Yahweh God, Jehovah God, the one who's the creator. He brings forth what we ought to say. So now when you make your plans, make your plans around God's word. And as you make your plans around God's word, God will give you what to say and how to say it. God will fix your tongue. Say, God, fix it for me. The songwriter just said, the songwriter said, he brought a change over me. Let me just, com let me just commend you right now, because I know you're going to allow God to bring a change over you. Let me just commend you for allowing God to change your tongue, to change your attitude, to make you more pleasant to deal with. Everybody in this room knows somebody you wish to, that, Lord... If you just touch him now, I won't have to touch him. You, you, you ought to pray, God, bring a change over my boss. Lord, either promote him or bring a change over him. Don't pray. Don't pray prayer like this. God, kill him off now. Whatever you do, get him out of my way at any cost. Pray, Lord, deliver him. Pray, Lord, bless his family. Pray, Lord, bless her attitude. Lord, bless her family in a mighty way. When President Obama was running, was running for, for president, they had T-shirts out. And they say, pray for President Obama. And then they showed a scripture. And all the folk who were with President Obama, who didn't look up the scripture, began to pray this scripture over this man's life. And the scripture that they referred to said, Lord, make his wife a widow, a widow, and make his children orphans. And folks just walking around, I mean, we holy, you know, we holy, but we won't read our word. And so even though people were with him, they began to go back home in their quiet time and pray this prayer over the president that said, make his wife a widow and his children are orphan. What that was saying is, kill him, Lord. What it was saying is, assassinate him, Lord. But, you know, we're spiritual. One of the worst things to be right now is evangelical. To be called an evangelical. That's why we New Beginning Bible Church. We do evangelistic stuff, but we don't want to be labeled with what I see evangelicals doing now. Evangelicals now saying that they got privilege over you. Evangelicals now are choosing stuff that will make your life miserable. Evangelicals now are caught up in stuff that they don't care what the United States of America does. They just got their pick. And some of them are worshiping an orange man. Worshiping an orange man. I saw a guy the other day. Police is surrounding his car. He rolled the window up, refusing to get out the car, refusing to open the door. He said, President Trump, come save me. President Trump, come get these demons from me. And he's praying to an orange man. He's praying to a physical man. And then there are others who, who have five, like a four or five foot statue that they roll in with a, a body of him chiseled on that statue. 
and they bow down to it. And they worship an orange man. And it's just as bad for us to look at what we call uh, Beyonce's church, where they have a whole church that's dedicated to Beyonce, where they sing Beyonce's music, and they have come to the conclusion this is for women to have self-esteem. And it's for self-esteem because black and brown women need something to look up to. Let me tell you, whether you're black, brown, red, yellow, or blue, you look to Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith. Because one of these days, those who worship Beyonce, those who worship Trump, is going to have to bow down to the name of Jesus. The Bible says that there will come a day that every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus the Christ is Lord of all. One of these days. Don't get caught up in the mix, the hype. Of all this newfound stuff where, where people are engaging with human beings, we need to engage with the awesome and the amazing God, the one who blesses us. I told you last week, brother says, C.J. Strout is the great Lord and Savior. We appreciate Strout. We admire the way he honors God every time he speaks. But if he was the Lord and Savior, he wouldn't have to honor Jesus Christ himself. Yes, he's doing amazing things, but the fact is there's only one God. His name is Jehovah God, Yahweh God. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. There's only one Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit who walks with us, he talks with us, and he makes us who we are. That Holy Spirit, he brings about our change. Verse number two says, all the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes. But the Lord weighs the spirits. A person may seem to do nothing wrong. In, in their own eyes, they are doing nothing wrong. I mean, you can see, people have come to the conclusion that January 6th was just a field trip. They have come to the conclusion that breaking wind, windows out, now they come to our neighborhoods and say we are hoodlums or hootlums, but I saw over 3,000 hootlands climbing up the walls of the Capitol, breaking out windows, going in office, throwing papers around, trying to upset an election. That's what I call a hootlum. Every last one of them. And they follow stuff, and they say they were right. And they say they can do whatever they want to do. The Bible says all of the ways of a man is pure in his own sight. But the Lord weighs the spirit. We have to try the spirit by the, by the spirit. We have to see if the same spirit that leads you is the same spirit that leading him or her. Try the spirit by the spirit in that when you try the spirit by the spirit, you want to make sure it lines up with God's word and lines up with the Holy Spirit. I told, you, I told you last week now, when you go down there to Luby's and, and Pearland, it's not there anymore. The place that's there on the outside, it says, we have your spirits. At least Sister Davis, Davis know what a spirit is. You all are holy people, so you all don't know what the spirit is. The, now, that Luby's that we flock to after church is no longer there because it has a place that serves spirits. It serves spirits now. And you now, Brother Miles, don't you run down there after the day at the church and get your spirits for the game. <laughs> the Bible says God weighs the spirits. There was a woman following Paul and them one day, following Paul, and they were walking down side the waters, and Paul and them were doing great things for the Lord, and this woman was following them, talking about these are great men of God. Follow them. These are great men of God. And Paul turned around and rebuked her because she had a spirit of divination. She had a demon in her. Everybody that, that encouraged you is not of God. Everybody that feeds you stuff is not feeding you stuff from the Lord. The Bible says God weighs out the spirit. 
God says that he looks at the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. And we think people are successful because of what they drive. How limited are our spiritualities? We think people are spiritual because they live in gated communities. And every time I go to a gated community, I just sit outside and wait on the next car to come. And when they push the button or push in the numbers, I just sit there and wait. In that same gated community that gives you a sense of false security that you pay an extra five fifty for a month, that same gated community, I just ride on in after the next car. And the thing about it, they got it set up for me to be able to do that because what happens is the, the, the gate begins to close, and when I get on the track, it'll open back up and let me in. And you pay an extra five fifty to six hundred dollars a month for your gated community, and people are going in and out of the gate in time. So I don't have to sit there more than five minutes, and I just sit there. And all of a sudden, brother Taylor, somebody comes up, and I just ride on in. I don't even have to follow them closely. Just ride on in. We have false sense of securities everywhere we go, and we pay for it. The psalmist says in Psalm 121, I look to the hills from which comes my help. My help come from the Lord. And the reason why the psalmist says that he looks to the hills is because during those days, they would look to the hills for the goddess. They would look to the hills for the false gods. Then the psalmist come back and say, yeah, I'm able to look to the hills, but I look to the hills from which comes my help. And then he follows it up by saying, my help comes from the Lord. Who made heaven and earth? He says, he says, but the Lord weighs. He weighs the spirit. He says, commit your works to the Lord. Commit your plans to the Lord. If you really want to be successful and you want your success to last, commit your works to the Lord. This word commit means to, to roll it over on God. This word commit means to throw it all on God. This word commit means to, to give it to God. Some preachers would tell you to give it to God and leave it there. Yeah, you need to give it to God, but you need to nurse it before God. It, it, says, it says to roll it over. It means to not worry about it, to roll it over. It means to run to God with your issues. Commit your works to the Lord. It's good to make plans. We ought to make plans, but we ought to work for the Lord. We ought to make plans. We ought to roll it over to the Lord. When we roll it over to the Lord or roll it over on the Lord, God is seeking an occasion to bless you. God, is, God knows more than we know. God can see further down the road than we can see. God can travel in the dark when it's storming outside. God travels way down the road. He sees where the fog is. It says commit your works, commit your deeds, commit your ways unto the Lord, and then you will have success. So your commitment is essential. Your commitment is important. Your commitment is what God wants from you because you know God is able to bless you. Man, man, man gave a boy a choice one day. He said, son, you can either move this little small rock or you can move this big boulder. Of course, the boy wanted to impress his daddy. So his daddy said, said the boy told him, I'm going to move the big one, daddy, because I want to make you happy. So the boy pushed the boulder and it didn't move. He got a stick and put it under the boulder and pushed it and it didn't move. The dad asked the boy, dad, boy, are you using all your strength? Yes, I am, dad. Are you using all you have? Yes, I am, dad. Are you using everything you have possession of? Yes, I am, dad. The dad said, no, you're not. And the reason why you're not using all your resources is because you hadn't asked me to help you. The problem is we get educated, we get strong, 
The problem is we get things in our minds, in our hearts, that we can do on our own, and we won't even ask God to help us. Let me tell you, whether you're a man, woman, boy, or girl, you need the Lord to help you. You're going to need him. You're going to need him. And you need to make preparation now to get with him. You're going to need the Lord to help you. It says, commit your works unto the Lord. Roll it over on him. And when the daddy helped the boy, they were able to move the boat. And they were able to move it well. He's our father. He's our God. And we can move things when God moves it. We can move things when God helps us to move it. God is the one that's sitting and waiting, watching you. That's why it's so important to pray. You ought to be calling on him, even when things are going good. Anybody in the room got it made? Anybody in the room don't have a word in your, in your heart and your troubles just pass you by and, and you don't have things going bad for you right now? You ought to be talking to God about it. You ought to thank him for what he's doing. Thank him for what he's done. And thank him for what he's going to do. You ought to T-A-N-K every time you T-H-I-N-K. Every time you think about what God has done, you need to thank him for what he's doing. And not only should you thank him for what he's doing, thank him for what he's already done. Not only should you thank him for what he's already done, you need to thank him for what he's going to do. Because we operate in faith. And as we walk in faith, we're able to get the blessings of God as we praise him and thank him. The writer, the wise writer, compares the slugger in the fool to one who is wise. The Bible says, the Bible says, in Proverbs 1 and 32, the Bible says the fool does not recognize who God is. The fool does not acknowledge God. The fool says, I can make it on, on my own. You can get your Ph.D. and be an educated fool. If you do not love God, do not honor God, do not walk with God. And then it says the slugger in Proverbs 6, verses 9 through 11. It says... The slugger has an undesirable end. A slugger means that you, you sit for a while and you do nothing. I oftentimes tell the New Beginning Church, you can't afford to be lazy because you don't have a lazy pastor. If you got a lazy, now there are some churches that have lazy pastors. I know some of them. I share with some of them. And if you are lazy, the Bible says it's just a little slumber of sleep, a little folding of your hands, and your whole field will grow up with weeds. So don't be lazy. Don't be a slugger. Always commit yourself to the Lord. He says, commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. It says, roll it over on God. In the thoughts that you have, God can fix it. And the good thing about God, he edits our thoughts. <laughs> the Bible says that, that the, the Holy Spirit interprets for us to God what our prayer is. The Holy Spirit, you can groan, and the Holy Spirit will interpret it. You see Aureli sitting back there? She's paying close attention to what I'm saying. And she's using a microphone. And what I'm saying, she is saying, other than my slang. What I'm saying, she's saying. And the people with the headsets on can understand in Spanish what I'm saying in English. And that's what the Holy Spirit, now she ain't the Holy Spirit. But that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. When we call on God, when we commit our ways to him, when we pray to God, what happens is the Holy Spirit interprets for us that which we can't say. Have you ever been so sick, sicker than you can be? And so upset that you, you can't even pray? Am I the only one in the room that's weak in my spiritual mind and in my spiritual heart? Have you ever been to a point where I didn't know what to ask God for and I could just moan and groan and, and the Holy Spirit take what I've said in my moaning and groaning and he takes it before God and before the next day God is blessing right where I needed a blessing regardless of what I said, regardless of what I didn't say, the Holy Spirit interprets it for me. 
commend ourselves to the Lord. Jesus is the ultimate example. He committed himself. Now here it is. God in the flesh commits himself to God the Father. And he gave his life for you and me. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a skull hill called Calvary. He died. They nailed him tight. They lifted him high. They dropped him low. He died on Calvary between two thieves. He died until the earth took an epileptic fit and reeled and rocked like a drunken man. He died until it became midnight at midday. He died until one centurion soldier cried out, Surely this must be the Son of God. He died, I tell you. They took him off the cross, laid him in a borrowed tomb. It was a borrowed tomb because early that third day morning, he got up with all power and heaven and earth in his hand. That same Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father making intercessions for you and for me. Every time we confess our sins, he forgives us for it. He's making intercession for us. But the good news today is one of these old days at the trump of God, the the dead in Christ shall rise. Jesus will stop in midair. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And those of us who remain will be caught up with him in midair and we will celebrate with him on the other side are you going with me I'm on my way to Beulah land I'm on my way to heaven's shore hallelujah to the lamb commit your ways unto him and God will establish all that you commit the door of the church is open the invitation is extended you ought to come to Jesus just as you are. My first invitation is that you receive Jesus as your personal Savior. Trust in the story that over 2,000 years ago, he died for you and he died for me. If you are going to heaven, you're going to have to trust Jesus' story. My first appeal is that you bow your head with me And invite Jesus into your life. Just repeat this simple prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you honestly prayed this prayer, believing in the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we believe that you're born again and you're on your way to heaven. My next appeal to you today, for those of you who do not have a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church. The door of the church is open for you. If you want to make this your church home, meet me right down here, and we'll be glad for you to come and join with us. Every person. Hallelujah. Bless you. God for those who have come. I believe that this is a good church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. If you don't have a church home, you need one. Those of us who are listening by broadcast, you need a church home. Foxes have holes, that's their home. Birds of the air have nests, that's their home. Every person needs a good church home. You need to come to Christ, and you need to come join church. My next appeal to you today are for those who need to be water baptized all the way under the water. This is a brand new year. 
what water, baptized, water baptism does is that you say to those of us who are watching, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died for my sins, and I believe he rose from the dead. And it is an outward showing of what you believe on the inside. So the door is open for those who wants to be water baptized. And we will walk you through the process. We will walk you through the meaning of the process. And then we will set a day for you to be water baptized. And we will rejoice with you. Amen. We have two have come. Why don't you come and, and tell us why you come. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Come and I'll tell them why you come. This is, um, now watch some of these people in this room. Watch them very closely. Uh, this is Johnny Taylor. <laughs> and this is his wife. So we, they have come to be members of the New Beginning Church. And we're glad they did. So they've received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That's a good place to clap right there. Amen. They've been water baptized all the way under the water and back up. Amen. And they come to be a part of the New Beginning Church, and we're so glad that they have come. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Brother Carter, Sister Carter, will you come up here and greet this couple and, and welcome them to the New Beginning Church. Hallelujah to the Amen. Lamb. Hallelujah. We're we are excited that Johnny Taylor has joined the church Amen. and Miss Taylor has joined the church. Amen. And we are glad that they have come and we, we are going to put them to work right away. Amen. They've been attending Bible study. They've been attending Bible study. They've been attending church service. And we are glad that they have come. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this couple. We thank you for their lives. We thank you, Father God, for them joining with us. We ask you to bless them, keep them, hold them, Father God. We ask you, Father God, to walk with them. And Lord, we ask you to give them strength and focus and bless them, Father God, to be a part of the mission and the vision. And Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Will you walk back with them and they're going to get you all signed up? Amen. Hallelujah. I have decided yeah, Lord. to follow Jesus. I've decided. I have decided. Yeah. Conclusion. I have decided yeah, to walk with to Jesus, follow Jesus, to follow Him all the way. No turning and I won't turn back. back. I will not. I will not turn back. No turning back. Amen. 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 When I said this is Johnny Taylor, brother Brandon started thinking. He thought he was going to break out in song for us. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. We want to thank our visitors for coming to visit with us. If you're visiting with us for the first time, will you stand and say hello to us? Amen. If you're visiting with us for the very first time. <laughs> hey, how yeah. you doing? That's, that's, oh. that's, that's Essence and Mahogany. mahogany. Amen. Oh. Essence and Mahogany came up through Turning Hearts Music on Summer, so we're glad to have them. And there's a young man standing back there with the youngest baby in the church. Stand up, Brother Poe, and tell us who you have with you. Sister Poe, stand up. Stand up, Sister Poe, and tell us. you bringing a visitor. He's from Mississippi. He, he, you know, you can always tell when a person from Mississippi, they don't say Mississippi. We say Mississippi. He's from Mississippi, so we're glad to have him. That's their brand new baby. How old is your baby? Three months old. Thank you so much for bringing two months old. 
Thank you for bringing your baby to church two months old. Amen. I'm looking forward to blessing that baby, holding that baby. As long as we got children being born, we got some future to look forward to. Amen. Uh, you all may know her as Michelle Babano. This is her husband, uh, Brother Poe, and uh, she is Michelle Poe now. Amen. And we're just glad to have them with us. Sister Davis, you have, Sister Davis Davis, you have someone visiting with us today. You do? Yeah, introduce your guest to us. Introduce your guest to us. Amen. Amen. He can stand. Stand, please, sir. Amen. You've been here before? Oh, you the one that wrote that big check? Oh, you the one that go write the big check? Okay. <laughs> Give us your name. You sure have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Amen. Yes. He sure is. Man, you had a little more hair then, though. <laughs> oh, okay. I tell you. I, tell you. I got to grow my bro tea back, though, huh? Yeah. Amen. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for coming. Amen. Thank you so much. That sure is. That sure is. My goodness. I must be getting old. That's why I ain't got no hair. That's why I don't have hair, because I'm getting old. Oh, my goodness. Hallelujah. We, you in good company. All these brothers in here that got hair right now, they, they get in there. Just, just give, them, give them some time. Give, give them some time. Matter, matter of fact, God made only a few real good heads. The rest of me put hair on it. <laughs> he just made a few real nice, good, smooth heads. The rest of them, he left hair on them, and so they... They want to be like us one day. Amen. Thank God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. It is offering time. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. You want to give electronically, you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Our P.O. Box is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. If you want to...